Hi everyone, today I'll be talking about selection of patients for thoracic surgeries. There are many patients nowadays who undergo thoracic surgeries like lung resections or other cardiac procedures. These patients are extremely prone to post-operative respiratory or cardiothoracic complications. So therefore, proper selection of patients is a very important part of pre-operative management for good post-operative recovery. The approach that we need to take for these patients is an individualized approach because no two patients are actually the same. The assessment of the patient's ability to tolerate lung resection is, an, is a very important thing. We must understand that if a patient cannot tolerate lung resection, obviously there is no point in going ahead with the surgery if the patient is eventually going to succumb. Many people are smokers, so cigarette smoking is an important risk factor for increasing post-operative pulmonary complications in these patients. So cigarette smoking cessation or abstinence is encouraged. The question is for how long, at least for four to eight weeks. Better if the patient never ever smokes again, but four to eight weeks is desirable. For smoking cessation, counseling is obviously used and it is most commonly used. However, combination therapy can also be used. Combination therapy is along with counseling, we give certain uh, pharmacologic, pharmacological treatment. So, combination therapy is actually more beneficial than counseling alone. Uh, this is according to what is given in the textbook of surgery, Sabiston's textbook of surgery. We must understand there are other adjuncts. These other adjuncts are DVT prophylaxis. DVT prophylaxis can be done in the form of subcutaneous heparin. Or there can be compress compressive stockings. Perioperative antibiotics are also important for preventing post-operative complications. Adequate pain control is important because adequate analgesia helps in good lung expansion. And obviously, if lung expansion is good, that prevents post-operative respiratory complications. These adequate analgesia can be given in the form of epidural catheter good IV analges analgesic or also in the form of thoracic blocks with long acting local anesthesia incentive spirometry is very important this is exercises the patient does bedside and improves in uh, lung expansion. Any obese patients have the problem of obstructive sleep apnea. For them, this particular option, nasal bilevel positive airway pressure, can be a very useful adjunct. Early mobilization of the patient, as we all know, is definitely better because if the patient keeps lying down, the patient develops a lot of respiratory complications like pleural effusion or hypostatic pneumonia and stuff like that. So obviously, more early mobilization is much better. Apart from these things that we need to take care of, we have to understand what physiological evaluations are. Because based on these evaluations, we are going to find out whether we can operate on this particular patient or not. So the first test that we usually do is a chest x-ray. That is the first test. In the chest x-ray, we can see a couple of things. Number one, we can see the actual pathology. Number two, we can see any other lung pathology. 
we can see both so in this particular uh, image if we take a look at this particular image this patient has a mass in the left upper lobe okay there's a mass like that there's a mass and even on the lateral view we can appreciate this particular mass however the lungs look pretty okay other than the prominent bronchoalveolar markings over here is a pretty prominent apart from that uh, and there's also a, a deviated trachea um, the rest of the lung uh, appears pretty okay the other tests which we can do is on spirometry and the pulmonary function testing the, apart from the chest x-ray the spirometry and the pulmonary function testing gives us various values and uh, gives us idea about uh, various parameters and we can get a good sense whether we can go ahead with the surgery or not so this is the first of the physiological evaluation the second type of physiological evaluation is forced expiratory volume and ppo forced expiratory volume one what is ppo ppo is predictive post operative fev1 which means that fev1 is a pre-operative value and predicted post-operative fev1 is what the post expiratory volume one will be in the post-operative phase after the lung dissections has been done all right so what is post expiratory volume one we ask a patient to breathe in okay so patient breathes in a lot of air and then forcefully expires the air the amount of air that the person breathes out in the first second first second this amount of air is actually called force expiratory volume in the first one second so this is a pre-op value this force expiratory volume one if it is more than 60 percent more than 60 percent then this patient can tolerate an anatomical lobectomy so we must understand that if fev1 is more than 60 percent then the patient can tolerate anatomical lobectomy if it is less than 60 percent then we need to do an additional test and that additional test is ppo fev1 okay so that additional test is ppo fev1 a very important line which was mentioned over here in the textbook is patients with a ppo fev1 of 35 to 40 percent should functionally tolerate the surgery that is obviously lung resection or lobectomy so we are hoping for the ppo fev1 to be 35 to 40 percent all right so how do we calculate this this is a slightly complicated procedure of fev1 the first thing we want to check is perfusion okay that is the first thing that we want to check so the patient comes in we inject radio tracers intravenously and we check for the perfusion so let's say there's a right lung and there's a left lung right lung and the left lung the left lung has got a mass and therefore in the radio tracer we can see that the perfusion is more in the right lung compared to the left lung 
obviously because a part of left lung is taken up by the tumor so we calculate what the perfusion is let's say the right lung has a perfusion of 60 percent or the left lung has a perfusion of 40 percent because totally it has to be 100 percent so right lung is taking up a lot of blood that is 60 percent of the blood and the left lung is taken up slightly less because of the tumor present and that is 40 percent now we have found out the perfusion percentages then the second question that we ask is what is the fev1 we find find out the fev1 which is obviously pre-op okay which is obviously pre-op now fev1 the concept is this fev1 which is in the pre-op is contributed to by both right and left lung now the surgeon said that i'm going to remove the complete left lung let's say i want to remove the complete left lung uh, uh, okay fine the left lung is going to be removed so the patient has only the right lung in the post operative period so the third step is calculate post operative fev1 and that calculation is done using the formula functional sorry post expiratory volume 1 multiplied by 100 minus left, left lung perfusion because we are going to take out the left lung so in this particular case the left lung perfusion was 40%. So the PPO V1 is going to be FEV1 multiplied by 100 minus 40%, which is 60% of FEV1. If this 60% of FEV1 is more than a certain value and it is a safe value, then we can go ahead and say that, yeah, all right this ppo fev1 is higher than the safe value we can go ahead with the resection in this particular slide you basically uh, are seeing the shortened version of what i just said that is ppo fev1 is equal to pre-op fev1 multiplied by 100 minus perfusion to the lung which is going to be removed all right 100 minus perfusion to the lung which is going to be removed or one minus fraction of the perfusion the region of plant resection whichever way is easier but i think this was easier for me uh, so i learned that a very important line that is a ppo fev1 of 30 percent or less carries a greater risk for supplemental oxygen and ventilator dependence so we can still go ahead with the resection but we must must warn the patient that hey look your ppo fev1 is less than 30 percent which means man your prognosis is not so great you're going to have a lot of problems in the post-operative period the next concept is dlco the first uh, let's let's have a quick recap the physiological parameters the first was chest x-ray spirometry uh, pulmonary function test second was uh, fev1 and ppo fev1 and the third one right now that we're going to study is dlco so what is dlco dlco we must understand this if this is the alveoli this is the blood and there are rbcs going this particular way in dlco the patient inhales uh, basically carbon dioxide mixed air and uh, sorry carbon monoxide mixed air so there are carbon monoxide molecules 
all right that is carbon monoxide molecules except for carbon monoxide molecules and the patient has inspired this air and out of this four two of them have gone and have bound to the rbc's so the re remaining two are expired out so that is the percent so two out of four is expired out that is 50 percent is the blco this is a simplified version of this i'm sure that the comp uh, the computations and the calculations are slightly more complex so uh, there are certain factual informations which is like uh, the single breath test for measuring dlco is the most commonly performed test the single breath test is the most commonly performed test as i've said the DLCO, me dlco measures the rate at which test molecules such as carbon monoxide move from the alveolar space to combine with the hemoglobin in the red blood cells dlco is determined by calculating the difference between inspired and expired samples of gas dlco levels less than 40 to 50 percent are associated with increased perioperative risk <clears throat> the next test that we want to talk about is cardiopulmonary exercise testing cardiopulmonary exercise exercise testing is a slightly complicated concept in that we take the patient we ask him to exercise maybe do cycling or something of that sort and we take a look at various parameters okay various parameters it's not just one parameter a lot of parameters and these parameters are echo sorry ecg electrocardiography heart rate response to exercise measurement of minute ventilation and oxygen uptake per minute these are the important <coughs> uh, factors that we keep in mind while while doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing this test is very important for those people who are marginal candidates who are marginal candidates that is ppo fev1 and dlco less than 50 percent of the predicted so in that we do cardiopulmonary exercise testing A cardiopulmonary exercise testing identify clinically occult cardiac disease that is its speciality that it can identify the cardiac disease which is actually occult and can actually lead to problem later on they provide a more accurate assessment of pulmonary function than spirometry and dlco why because we take in so many different parameters there is another concept which is called vo2 max we must be familiar with it but at this particular stage um, we must understand uh, it, it's basically the amount of oxygen that the muscles are consuming for doing exercise is it consuming more is it consuming less the lactic building up there are a lot of factors but i really suggest that we understand just the fact that is the uh, and remember just the fact that is vo2 max uh, less than 11 to 15 is associated with an increased risk on vo2 max less than 10 indicates high risk which means that by the time the vo2 reaches 10 the lactate have start building up which is not a good thing so it is high risk and 11 to 15 which means by the time the vo2 reaches 11 to 15 the lactate starts building up so slightly a more amount of time therefore it is not high risk but it is increased risk so vo2 less than 10 ml per kg this is high risk and vo2 less than 11 to 15 ml per kg there is just increased 
risk. The last test that we want to talk about is the six minute walk test. It is the measure of cardiac and pulmonary reserve. Basically, if a patient can walk more than 1000 feet in this six minute walk test, then the post operative course is mostly uncomplicated. However, we must understand that no single test result should be viewed as an absolute contraindication to surgical resection. Therefore, again, reiterating or re-emphasizing that it should be uh, should be an individualized approach. With that, we complete this particular segment, a short segment, and uh, kindly comment and uh, kindly uh, let me know what i can explain and let's have a good discussion thank you this is how i want to end my class